Let's open the scriptures together and read two fairly obvious sections, ones that we'll comment on either later in this meeting or in the next meeting. We'll begin in Matthew chapter 18. And the familiar and important verse number 20. However, before we read 20, I want to read 18. Actually, uh, 17 will begin. And if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, then it be unto thee as an heathen man and a publican. Verily I say unto you, whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever ye shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again, I say unto you that if any two of you shall agree... On earth, as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together to my name, there am I in the midst of them. Over to Acts chapter 2, please. And we'll read together the section beginning in verse 41. And they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, and in the fellowship, and in the breaking of bread, and in the prayers. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. So with these two readings, we have two great texts that Early on in the New Testament, introduce us to the topic we are going to take up today, which is why believe in the local assembly. Now, some of you have been present pretty faithfully through the last two years, and you understand that we have been heading here for two years. We have begun with the biggest possible, most embracive circle, and we've tightened it slightly each time. We've come from the big to the medium-sized, and now we might say to the smaller, to the more focused. But I'm going to submit to you that the very principles that we used from meeting number one are still applicable to us today. The same view of scripture that we adopted when we understood it, it was God's infallible and errant word, is the very scripture we need to apply to this subject today. We ask, just to review extremely quickly, why believe in God? We're not afraid of that question because there are compelling reasons from the world around us, from the mind God has given us, from the conscience in our hearts, from our experience that God brings us to, to understand that there is a God, and we went through some of those arguments. We understood as well that that God had written for us a scripture, a Bible, a word of God, and that he completed it, and that it was perfect. And using reason, and using the tools that Brother Andrew Robertson gave us that day, we came to understand what we already knew and believed, of course, that the word of God is enduring and abides forever. Once we have that word in hand from the God who is, we begin to apply it. We understand that this makes us creationists because everything that God says in his word is infallible. And the word of fallible men may or may not agree with the Bible, but the Bible tells us what really is and what really was. We understand as well the identity of God's son, Jesus Christ. Again, using revelation and using reason, we came together to understand that he is who he claimed to be. The only begotten son in the bosom of the father who came down and took manhood upon himself, the word made flesh, who dwelt among us. We understood his perfection. We understood that his death was a penal substitution. It wasn't just some death to be an example to people. It wasn't just a martyr's death or an unfortunate end to a man who had made a lot of enemies. But rather, it was ordained from eternity that this would be the Lamb of God who would bear away the sin of the world. We understood the nature of that atonement. We understood the reality of the resurrection and its place in apologetics because once we understand that the resurrection, the most attested fact in history, is true, then it validates everything else that has gone before and again, everything that follows. And so we have enjoyed all those truths together. And so far, so good. So far, those who would detract from us are outside this building for the most part. Unfortunately, we didn't really attract that many skeptics to these early meetings. We would have welcomed them, but we didn't get them. And it wasn't really a debate because we didn't give microphones out to people who disagreed with us. On the other hand, when we come to today's topic, I'm going to argue that the progression is carrying on. And the same principles that we used in the early meetings apply and obtain today. And that if we are as honest with this truth 
as we were with the other truths, we will come to understand that God has indeed set down a pattern and a design for his people to meet in the local assembly today. The problem is some detractors may be in the room. Now, I think better of you than that. I'm really not throwing potatoes from the, or, or eggs might be better, from the platform. But let's put it this way. Some people who dis disagree with us are very sincere, honest, God-honoring Christians. So instead of being a debate with the outside world, we now have an intramural debate. And yet with grace, but with confidence, we go to the word of God and we ask what saith the scriptures. So this is a good time for me to put a couple of very clear and I hope very gracious dis disclaimers in place, all right? I am not going to in my part of this meeting, nor will we in the second meeting defend North American gospel halls. That's not what this is about. We are rather interested in defending a pattern. The pattern. We, we're imperfect. The pattern, it's perfect. It is the pattern we're extolling. It's the pattern we're studying. It's the pattern we want to be part of today. And we thank God for the heritage that we have and the extent to which it does comport to that pattern, but it isn't the gospel halls or this assembly that we're championing. We're championing, championing that's the word, the pattern, the word of God. Job said to his very unhelpful friends, no doubt you are the people and wisdom will die with you. Job 12, one through two. If we take on that sort of haughty arrogance today, you might as well pack up and so might I and go home. That is not honoring to Christ. We are not saying that. We are saying it is the pattern, the word of God that we want to extol and to understand today. You know, as that Far Side cartoon, you probably remember one of the more famous ones where a man is talking to his dog and he's expounding something, I can't remember the topic, and his little, his little talk bubble, and the dog in his little auditory bubble is hearing blah, 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 because he doesn't understand English, and they're talking past each other. You remember that? So this sometimes happens in meetings like this. I say, isn't the pattern great? But the audience hears, aren't we great? No, no. Isn't the pattern great? You say, you're saying, aren't you great? No, I'm not saying that. Let's not talk past each other. Understand my language. It is the word of God we want to look into and to exalt and extol today. And if we don't match up, we need to correct ourselves. There are many people, God-honoring, wonderful Christians, better than I. I won't say better than you, I'll just make it better than I, who are in denominational systems and in errors in places that hold scriptural error. What should our attitude be toward them? Our attitude should be, number one, we thank God for them. Number two, we are in fellowship with them. You say, I didn't think we were in fellowship with them. We are in family fellowship with them, 1 John chapter 1. We share the same God. We share the same Son. We share, we share the same salvation together. And we should rejoice and we should be glad whenever we see a Christian. We should never consider ourselves in any sense better <clears throat> than they are. Or we will be guilty of the very pride that will blind us from understanding the topic we're looking at today. It's very important to remember, too, that God in his sovereignty will raise up men and women, but particularly I'm thinking of male teachers, in systems that are not scriptural. You say he would never do that. Oh, yes, he would. He's sovereign. Let me remind you that he raised up Elijah and Elisha in apostate Israel. That was his business. You say, Elijah, what are you doing up there? The first thing you should do is make a beeline for Jerusalem because that's where the house of God is. Go to the people of God. Get away from that apostate system. But God says, no. In my sovereign plans, I'm having this man stay here. Does that mean then that the contemporary prophets who were in Jerusalem, the prophets of Judah, should have all gone north and taken the example? No. They had no business going to an apostate nation. They needed to stay with the house of the Lord and with the truth that they had been given. But in God's plan... There's Elisha and Elijah before him working for God in an ungodly system. So let's not forget that. Let's thank God even for the teachers that we have benefited from who are not in our circles. And this is one of the first places where we might give ourselves a spanking because you might know historically that at least in English-speaking countries in the last 200 years, the brethren, and allow me to use that expression, all right? That's, a, that's not a term I like. We're not the brethren because that smacks of some sort of organization. 
but those who gather in assemblies like this one were the ones who taught the evangelical world. There was Thomas Newberry, there was Samuel Tregellis, there was W.E. Vine, there was men, there were men like C. T. Studd, and there were men, not so, he wasn't so much a teacher, but an example from the assembly line. Um, I, I'm thinking of C.E. Stewart, actually, not C.T. Studd, scratch that one from the record. That's a different story for a different time. Uh, there were men right up until Pauli and Ellison, and you may not know all these men, but up until about 1955, 1960, they taught the evangelical world. What we've seen is a sea change since then. Now the evangelical world teaches the assemblies. Therein lies a critical problem. Number one, what's wrong with us? Number two, we are not going to get the whole counsel of God from those people. But thank God for what we do get from them. So now, my disclaimers are over. This is an apologetics meeting. We are making arguments. And I just want you to understand that if anything I say has a bit of an edge to it, I hope it won't be too cynical, but if it has a little bit of a bite, my pre-stated statements about what I really think of Christians in other denominational systems, I hope stands, right? I love them. I wish they understood some of the things I've been taught. Now, what's the purpose of this meeting? How long will it go on? And do you really need to listen to me for over an hour? Well, no. First of all, I'm going to break this up. We're going to have a song, a hymn, we'll call it, halfway through, and you'll get to get stretched for five, ten minutes, and then we'll make a valiant attempt to call everybody back in. So we'll divide the meeting in two. I also don't want to duplicate the outline, which you haven't seen yet, some of you have, which is quite extensive that we want to look at in the second meeting. I want to be rather thematic in this meeting and to take on some topics that I think are important that I see I have rarely heard discussed in public, so I'll give them a try. The first objection I want to take to the truth of the local assembly is a very common one today. You believe, this is them speaking to me, you believe in the local assembly because you were raised in the local assembly. We weren't raised in the local assembly, so we don't believe in it. We have our own understanding of the scriptures and our own way of meeting. We have our own tradition. We were born into a different denomination. And therefore, what you believe may be okay for you, but don't try to shove it down our throats because that's your truth, not ours. Now, this is very similar to an argument that we met in the, in the first meeting about why I believe in God. Richard Dawkins says, if you had been born in Saudi Arabia, you would be a Muslim. If you were born in ancient Norway, you would worship Wotan. But just the fact that you were born in Christian America means that you're a Christian. Well, the first thing I'd like to say to Mr. Dawkins is yes, and Mr. Dawkins, if you were born in Saudi Arabia, you would be a Muslim. And if you had been born in ancient Norway, you would be a worshiper of Wotan, wouldn't you? So what, where does that argument take us? But I, we need to be honest about this. Because we are teaching something which many of us have been brought up in, we need to be doubly, even triply careful with what we say. We must allow for the possibility that what we have been taught is wrong. We must go back to the only source that could correct anyone, the scriptures, and we need to understand, is it or isn't it true? That's what we want to do today. There is the chance of bias. There is a real risk of prejudice, right? Because that's how I was brought up. The fact that I was brought up doesn't make it true, but then it doesn't make it false either, does it? It either is true or it isn't true. And the only way we can know is to go to the scriptures. Now you say, isn't it coincidental that you were born in a family that believed in local assembly truth? Isn't that how you imbibed it? Well, I thank, I thank God I was raised in such a family, and yet I have to tell you in all honesty and candor, there was a time in my early 20s when I was ready to examine everything from the ground up and accept nothing. I have come to accept it, I believe, I trust, because I've been convinced by the word of God that it is so. You say, but come on, statistically, there aren't that many of you. Statistically, there are far more Christians in other systems. What has statistics got to do with it? If Prince Charles wakes up every morning, he probably says, I can't be heir to the British throne. I've never met anyone else who's the heir to the British throne. As far as I know, there are no other heirs to the British throne. Therefore, I couldn't be one either. Could I? Well, yes, you could. You either are or you aren't. Numbers don't matter. Statistics don't count, right? So we are looking at truth. I trust objectively, and it's not just because I was brought up with it that I believe it, although I thank God I was brought up with it. 
But this raises a larger question and a larger problem that I want to deal with here, which is that earlier statement I made somewhat cynically. You have your truth and we have our truth. You have your traditions and we have ours, as if they're equally valid. Now, if there is one truth, they both can't be equally valid. And yet, convincing people today in a postmodern world that that is true is a super challenge, okay? Because in the old world, this is before the, quote, enlightenment, which I call the endarkenment, before that, people knew what they knew primarily by revelation. They used reason, but reason was subservient to revelation. With the enlightenment came the view that, no, while there is objective truth, the only way to find it is through reason, and revelation doesn't count anymore. That led to the infidelity of 1789 to 1989, we might say. But in our modern world, truth is not sought and found by revelation. Truth is not sought and found by reason. Truth is not sought and found at all, because truth does not exist. Truth, quote unquote, is simply preference. It's simply what works for me. It's what happens to suit me and my culture that I grow up in. And it's going to be very different, very radically different, perhaps, in another culture that grows up with different values. Therefore, what we call truth in our lives is really a story. It's a fictional story. We call it, let's call it a narrative, okay? And then we're going to take all the narratives in our lives, all the fictional stories that we were brought up with, and we'll create a meta-narrative. This is what the new, the, the new people, the so-called postmodernists call education. And then you may come, if you wish, to the high priests of postmodernism and offer a sacrifice called tuition. And we will graciously deconstruct your meta-narrative. We will deconstruct it. We will tear it apart. We will show how flawed it is, how biased it is, how parochial it is, how personal it is, and that it can't possibly be true for other people in other places. And so we have this view that you have your view, I have mine, I'm okay, you're okay, and the Bible, whatever it says is okay, whatever it means to you is fine. There is no one truth about how we should gather today. Now, of course, some of these liberals, if they are such, will also say there's no one way to, to God either, right? And there's no one way of salvation. But let's put those people aside and come back into the intramural debate here and talk with people who are really believers. It's funny. When you come to salvation, they don't buy the old line that as long as you're sincere, it doesn't matter what you believe. They know better than that. But when it comes to church truth, they want to haul that old saw out again and say, it doesn't matter what you believe as long as you're sincere. Because if it works for you, that's fine. What I have works for me. This is so ingrained in us, you may think you're wasting time on this. This is not a waste of time. This is foundational. This is why assembly testimony, in part, is threatened so much today. Because assembly truth, like all Bible truth, is propositional truth. It is real truth. It is truth that is ahistorical, if you let me use that word. It was true in the year 12. It was true in the year 1012. It is true in the year 2012, and it will be true in 2212, or however many years there are until the Lord comes. It's true in Mexico City. It's true in Medicine Hat. It's true everywhere for all people at all times. And yet there are people today who don't understand that such truth really exists. That when I say something is true to you, it isn't because I wish it or believe it, it's because it is true. And I'm asking you to look at the evidence and believe it with me. Truth has to correspond to reality, right? Truth has to be consistent. It has to include all the data that's called comprehensive, I suppose, but all the data have to fit together and make sense together. Truth has to be coherent. It has to make sense when you look at it together. And if you apply those simple principles of what truth is to the word of God, I submit that out of the chute comes the local assembly. When your question on the entry board is, what does God want me to be a part of today? Now, I want to take this a little farther. All claims are not equally valid. The easiest way to prove that, of course, is to look at the very language these people use. They're very certain about uncertainty. Watch the irony in these statements. I hope it's obvious. They're very certain, 100% certain, that everything is uncertain. They won't tolerate intolerance. 
They're absolutely sure there are no absolutes. And the very truest thing to them is that there is no truth. Now those to, to us are very nonsensical statements. They're self-defeating. They can't possibly be true. But do we meet people who are like this today? Yes, indeed we do. I'll tell you some people I've met. These are real life examples. I have met Christians who say they believe the word of God is inerrant, but deny the existence of absolute truth. I have met Christians who say they are followers of Jesus Christ, but live in a very immoral way and don't see the disconnect, don't see the inherent contradiction in that. I have even met a person who says he's a follower of Christ and believes in Christ, but does not believe the historical Jesus existed. Now you say, how can that be? How can any of those examples exist? Welcome to our world. And we love our postmodern people in the world. We don't love their postmodernism. But we need to understand this, because where does this, where does this meet the assembly truth that we're supposed to be here to talk about today? Very simply, we must start with the premise that this is objective truth, and that if we come to it with honesty and with sincerity and with humility and with the Spirit of God aiding us, we will come to something that is objective and real. That is the premise. But that has to be explained today, and that's what I've been attempting to do. Now, I would like to move to the very uh, fundamental question, why the assembly? Why did God design an assembly? Why does God call people out of the world today to be in assemblies? And what is the overarching purpose? And why should assemblies hold meetings? After all, we live in an electronic age, and I can be an e-Christian, and I can attend any church I want, virtually. I don't have to leave my house. I can stay there, and I can be multiply enrolled in multiple churches. And what's wrong with that? Well, there's a lot wrong with that, and I'd like to explain why. First of all, God has called people out that he might dwell with them, right? The assembly is the dwelling place of God on earth. Multiple assemblies, each taking character from that one large assembly. And we'll talk about the difference between the large aspect of the church, that is, the body of Christ, like Ephesians truth, and compare and contrast that to the local expression of that, which is, of course, the local assembly, say, 1 Corinthians or 1 Timothy truth, right? But God has, in all, both of those models, continued his theme of wishing and wanting and desiring to dwell with his people. Let's do a quick survey of this in the Bible. You, you're well aware of all this, but let's just walk through it. Number one, Garden of Eden. God comes down in the cool of, day, of the day and walks with the man and with the woman. He wants fellowship. He wants to be with them. He wants to commune with them. Sin comes in. God calls Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldees. He forms a people, Israel. He brings them out of Egypt through redemption. And the first thing he wants to do is he wants to meet with them. He wants a home. He wants a place he can dwell. And he gives the rules and the stipulations for how that will be built. It's erected. And then his glorious presence comes in and dwells there. He's now dwelling in the midst of his people. This is 1450 BC, right? Roughly. And this continues on. We have the tabernacle that goes all the way to the time of King David. It's been living for quite a few years in Shiloh. Then David says, look, I'd like a place for God to dwell. I have this beautiful house of cedar, and God's still in the tent. We've got to do something about this. So he says, I'm going to construct a house for God today. But God says, no, thank you for your interest. You're not going to build me a house, although I'll build you a house. How's that? But you're not going to build me a house because I'd like your son Solomon to do that for me. So David says, that's fine. I'll get the materials together. I'll make sure everything's ready so that when I die, the next generation can just take off at a run and continue this wonderful project. And so the temple is built in around 960. Temple number one, the first temple, the Temple of Solomon, a place for God to dwell. That temple goes on to 586 when it is destroyed by the Babylonians. One of the most beautiful, amazing structures ever made in the world, unfortunately completely obliterated. The Jews go into exile, but then they come back under Zerubbabel, right? And God creates, they build temple number two, the temple of Zerubbabel, which continues on in about 20 AD. Herod enlarges and improves it. And it's still pretty much under construction. Just the finishing touches are being added at the time of Christ. But then because the Jews broke in a very serious way, their contract with the Roman government, Titus Vespasian comes in in AD 70, and destroys that second temple, completely destroys it. But then we have a big gap, and we're in that gap today. And God still has a dwelling place, and it was hinted at by the very coming of Christ into the world who said that his body was the temple of God. 
God has three different temples, three different tiers, three different levels of dwelling today. Number one, if you're saved, he dwells in your heart. You are the temple of God. You have the spirit of God dwelling within you. You, personally, individually, are a dwelling place for God today. This is a spiritual reality that really is just mirrored and follows after the physical realities of Israel, and the, the things that went all the way back to the Garden of Eden. And then tier number two, God dwells in all of the believers who are coming to him out of every nation and tongue and kindred and people throughout the dispensation from Pentecost to the rapture. The only thing is that church, that large church, has not yet had a meeting. You say, one thing about assemblies, they like to have meetings. Well, the big assembly hasn't had a meeting yet. It's still waiting to hold its first meeting. Its first meeting will occur at the rapture. You understand that, right? But it will be a habitation for God to dwell in through the Spirit. What else? Very important, our topic today. God has a third place, a third tier, a third level. I'd prefer to consider this where he dwells today, and that is where people gather to the name of his Son, the Lord Jesus. The house of God, the pillar and ground of the truth, right? So God desires to dwell with his people. And just to complete the story, you understand that after the Lord returns, there will be another temple. It will be the third temple. It will be built in the tribulation. Halfway through the tribulation, it will be desecrated by the man of sin. It will ultimately be destroyed and replaced by the fourth and final temple described in Ezekiel chapter 40 through 43, Isaiah chapter 2, Isaiah chapter 56, and that will be the millennial temple. And then what about the end? The tabernacle of God is with men. The new Jerusalem. I saw no temple there because the Lamb is the temple thereof, right? God will still dwell with his people. He wants to be with us. He wants to dwell with us. So clearly that is the main reason why God wants there to be a local assembly today. Now, another reason is that there are a whole variety of things that you and I may not, cannot do by ourselves. You've seen those wonderful TV shows, typically infomercial type things, and they have to put the disclaimer at the bottom, don't try this at home. Okay. Well, there's a lot of Christianity you don't try at home, okay? You say, what in the world are you talking about? Well, it's very important to understand that God is the God of the individual, but he's also the God of the group. For most of human history, people have considered that God was the God of the group, and they could not believe that he was the God of the individual. But blessedly true, he is. He saves each and every one of us. He loves all of us separately, individually, separately, and he would have given his son for any one of us. He loves individuals. But in 2012, we need to kind of turn the tables and understand that there are very few people today who are worried about what God thinks about groups. They only care about what God thinks about them because we are in the me generation, the individualistic generation. And as true as that may be, we now need to turn the tide and say, look, there are things you can't try at home. You say, what are they? Well, it just so happens I have some written down here. It's called getting ready, right? Oh, how about headship? And there's a w limited way in which a husband and wife and a family can show headship at home, but one in person cannot show headship. You say, big deal. It is a big deal. This is the biggest of all deals to God. Headship is the big thing to God. You say, it isn't to me. It is to him. You say, covered heads of sisters, I don't intuit what that really means. You know, I think that's just interesting, but is it important? Why don't you ask God about that? God thinks it's the most important thing because to him, the headship of his son has to be displayed and glorified. You can't do that at home. You need to come together with Christians and form a body to do that. What about um, priesthood? You say, well, ever since the Reformation, we've recovered the wonderful truth that every believer is a priest, have we not? Yes, we have. Every believer is a priest. We don't need any mediator other than the Lord Jesus himself, of course, to get to God. We have direct access to the heavenly sanctuary ourselves, and we're able to offer sacrifices to God, the fruit of our lips, the ways of our life. We're able to be priests in that sense. But every time you see priesthood functioning in the Old and in the New Testament, it's always a group of priests coming together. Priesthood is a collective thing. You come to worship together in a way you can't do at home. Therefore, don't try that at home either. Number two, three, whatever. Fellowship. You can't share things unless you have someone to share them with. 
You can't work together unless you have somebody to take the other side of the yoke with you. You, you need to sh put your shoulders together in spiritual work and in the enterprise such as in the gospel, Philippians chapter 1, right? That requires other people than you. So don't try that at home either. How about unity? God wants unity among his people. But unity implies that there are divergent people, there is diversity that is brought together in reconciliation and in harmony. So there again, you can't be unified by yourself. What about um, the breaking of bread? A very important memorial, a command of the Lord, something we must do week by week. You can't do that by yourself. How about um, the fruit of the Spirit? You say, well, I love God and I'm I have joy in my heart, and I have peace all by myself. Well, fine. But what about the other six? Long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. You need other people to do those things. You need other believers, first of all. Then you need a bunch of unbelievers who hate you. Then you can show that. But you can't do it by yourself. What else? What about, the, what about uh, gift? Is any gift in the Bible ever for me to enjoy personally myself? No. Every gift is for serving others, that I might be Christ to other people. Therefore, there's a requirement of other people. I need to come together with other believers in order for me to use whatever gift I have and to receive the blessing of your gift to me. This is very elementary, but I'm laboring the point. How about membership? Because the New Testament assembly is described metaphorically as a body. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, we have three different bodies, and we might look at that a little bit later. We have the first mention of the body of Christ. And by one spirit, by, in one spirit, all of us were baptized unto one body, right? Then he talks about a regular human body and uses it as an illustration. Then at the end of the chapter, he says, you, yes, you Corinthians, you meeting, you assembly there, you are body of Christ. And all of you are members in that body. Now, let me just briefly say something about this because this would be a whole meeting unto itself. This is what God intends. Eyes, ears, heads, with the head, of course, of himself being Christ in this metaphor, and all the other body parts. Some of them quite visible in public and respectable. Some of them kept under wraps because they are not for public display. Every one of those is essential, is essential. Now, we live in an egalitarian world that says, I'm as good as you are. You're no better than I am. I'm saying it rather cattily, but isn't that the attitude? We're all equal, which means I'm as good as you are. Pardon the English. Now, is that true? Well, in an egalitarian system, in fact, it is true. If you have everybody in a team, and they're all playing the same part, if they're all quarterbacks, everyone is expendable except maybe one of them. It's a waste. Why have that many quarterbacks? Is that's not a team. There's no I in team, as the old saying goes, right? Although I find the word me is in team, but that's a little wrinkle that we have to deal with. It makes that illustration not work too well. But all of us have a part. You see, if every one of us is different in a body, then every one of us is essential. You only have one pinky on the left side and one on the right. You need them both. There's no two body parts that are identical, and therefore nothing is expendable. And for the body to work as a body, all of them have to be present, and all of them have to be working together in harmony. So you have a football team, not all quarterbacks, but you have all the different positions. You have a string quartet. You have a violin, a viola, a cello, and a double bass. You need all four of them for this thing to work. So an assembly is no different. You need everybody who is part of that assembly to come together and be in the body part of the body functioning to make the body work. Don't try that at home either. So those are some things that I would like to emphasize. Now, the house of God displays God's glory in a way that individuals cannot do. Let's go back to Israel for a minute. Where do you see the glory of God in Israel? Is it in the indi individual Israelite? Well, redeemed from Egypt, from slavery to sonship, I think you can see a little bit of God's glory in them. But where does God's glory really come into display? In the tabernacle, in the temple, in the assembly, and in the new Jerusalem. What a privilege then it is to be part of something that displays God's glory in a unique way that individually we could not do. So those are some of the reasons why 
God has called us to be in assemblies. And we'll talk more about some of the details in meeting number three, two, whatever it is. Next one. Here's my next point, my next thematic subject. What about those who say, we believe in core doctrines and assembly truth is not a core doctrine? Have you ever heard that one before? We believe that every truth that's important in the New Testament is like a three-legged stool. It has to be talked about by Jesus in the Gospels. It has to be practiced in the Acts. And it has to be taught in the Epistles. And if it doesn't meet all three criteria, it doesn't stand. By the way, that's taking a very interesting observation that very often truth in the Bible is exactly presented that way and turning it into a man-made rule. Let's apply that to a very simple verse that I can think of that's behind me. God so loved the world only as stated once in the Bible. It doesn't meet the three-legged stool criteria. Therefore, it must not be for today. Well, of course it is. How many times does God need to say something for it to be true? Exactly once. And anything that is in the Bible and stated once, that is written not only for me as in terms of benefit, but to me in terms of instruction, I must obey and consider as important as everything else. Now you say, come on, come on, come on. There are core doctrines after all, aren't there? Yes, there are. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 3. I delivered unto you as of first importance what I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he was raised again the third day according to the scriptures. He was seen in Cephas and then the 12 and so on. That is core doctrine because to us, our salvation depends on that. Every one of those statements is essential for us, for our benefit, for us to be saved. Therefore, to us, that is important. But I could turn this core, doc this core doctrine argument on its head. I could actually spin it around and say, if core doctrines are those which are most important, to whom are they most important? Well, you say, of course, to me, because I'm the subject I like to talk about. All right, let's talk about you for a minute. Core doctrines to you are the doctrines that save you from hell, that save you for heaven, that put you into the family of God. I agree. I'm, I'm not despising that, of course. I think that is glorious and wonderful and true. But shall we ask a different question? If we're on the subject of core doctrines, which doctrines are most important to God? We say, I hadn't thought of that. Well, I'll give you a hint. I've already told you the answer to one of them. Headship is, ex is exceedingly important to God. You say, but it's not on my short list. Yes, but it's on God's short list. You must understand that his glory is what this is all about. And the exaltation of his son is what we're talking about. Not our personal tastes and preferences and what works for us. Not what we can intuit and make sense to us even. But what makes sense to him. So if you're going to talk the core doctrine argument, I'm going to ask, what are God's core doctrines? And I submit the assembly is very much one of them. However, this is an arrogant position in my view. Who is the arbiter to decide where we draw the line between the doctrines that are no longer core and that are expendable? I'm not prepared to make that distinction. Are you? Here's another point that I think is very important. The Bible does not present doctrines. It does not present gospels. It does not present deposits in the plural. It doesn't give us different counsels of God, one for Monday and one for Tuesday and one for Wednesday. All of these things that I've just mentioned, whether it is the whole counsel of God, the deposit, the form of sound doctrine, the body of truth, all of these things are in the singular. In fact, you know, the law is in the singular. And this is a very good way to illustrate what I'm trying to get at. The Bible views all of this as a singularity. You take it or you leave it. You have no right, no authorization to cherry pick your way and take through, through it and take the ones you like out of it. James make a, makes a very provocative statement. He says, whoever keeps the whole law and yet offends at one point, he's guilty of all. And the usual way we handle that in the gospel is saying, look, if you're a sinner and you're showing you're capable of breaking one, you're certainly capable of breaking all of them. And probably in your heart you have broken all of them, even if you haven't out in your real life, so therefore you've broken them all. That is true, but I suggest that's maybe not exactly what James is saying. James is saying you have a law, singular. And if you fracture it on this side, the whole law is broken. It is not something to be accepted. I believe in the first five commandments, but I'm not a proponent of the last five. No Israelite has a right to say that. You take all ten or you leave them. So in a very real sense, the New Testament is a deposit 
The gospel is something that does not end at conversion, but it includes all that Jesus began to do and to teach. That's why in Matthew chapter 28, the Lord says, I want you to go and make disciples, not just Christians, but disciples, not just believers, but disciples of all nations. I want you to baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, and I want you to teach them what? Core doctrines. Not core doctrines, no. All things whatsoever I have commanded you. So the entire revelation of Scripture is what Christ wants us to bring into the lives of all those who have believed on him as Savior. Core doctrines. I'm going to throw you out out a couple of other statements that I have heard in my short lifetime. Doctrine divides. We want to be in a community of love, not a community of light. We believe in life not doctrine. Now you can take this back uh, right to the Garden of Eden if you want to, but because the devil's good at this, but I'm going to say historically, you need to look at the life of Friedrich Schleiermacher. Schleiermacher. I'll say that again. The German needs a little bit of practice. Schleiermacher. Okay. You say, who is he? He's the father of modern theological liberalism, according to most people in the West. He did not attack major doctrines. He did not assault the atonement at first. All he said is that doctrine is being overrated. Christianity is about living, not about teaching. It's about love, not about life. It's about relationships, not about light. By saying all those things, of course, he's driving a big, painful, broad wedge where God never intended a wedge to go. God is a God of love. He's a God of relationships. He's a God of life. He's a God of joy. He's a God of all those things. But he's a God of truth. And how do you know what love is unless I give you the definition from God? And how do you know what fellowship is and what relationships are and what is important in life, all the things you want to, quote, experience in your Christian life? How will you understand those things apart from God's truth? How will you understand who Jesus is apart from propositional truth? You say, I'd love to know Jesus better personally. I'll tell you how to do it. Get to know him better propositionally. You say, what do you mean by that? Go to the scripture and find out what it says about him. Then you will understand who he is. Then your personal relationship will grow. If you would try to drum this up with feelings and with fantasies that do not comport with truth, then you are fantasizing about a savior who isn't the savior. He's one you've constructed. So these are false dilemmas. These are straw man arguments. These are things that are very, very specious and they need to be understood. We believe in in a community of life. We believe in a community of love. But it's all based on the fact that we have light. We have truth, right? Next, and just before we break, I want to talk about the cult of professionalism. Because you and I are members of it, even though we don't remember when we signed up, we are members of the cult of professionalism. We are worshipers of the experts. In fact, if you want to sell something, all you need to do is get a guy with a white lab coat and a clipboard and horn rim glasses. And he's got to say something intelligent and pour some blue fluid from one test tube into an Erlenmeyer flask. And it's true because it's science. It's science. And it's not only science, but it's science taught by an expert. Someone with a PhD who's been granted a doctorate. Funny thing is, all the major scientific discoveries that were done in the years of about 1200 to 1900 were done by amateurs. You ever think about that? The more expert we have gotten, the dumber in some ways we've gotten. Professionalism. If someone doesn't have the right credentials, if someone doesn't have the right background, it doesn't belong to the right society, his words are meaningless. They're worthless. They don't count for anything because he's not an expert. You say, where did this idea of experts come from? I'll tell you where it came from. It came from the experts. <laughs> they have every interest in having you fear them and obey them without questioning. Richard Dawkins even thinks of himself and his fellow atheists as the brights, which I assume means we're all the dulls. We're too dumb to understand what they understand. But if we'll just shut up and listen, they'll dispense like a priest. They'll give us the oblation for the day. And we'll be blessed, right? That's what they think. Now, I'm being extremely cynical. But, you know, I belong to a profession. I belong to a society. I have a conferred degree. 
Does that mean that I know everything? Of course it doesn't. Does it mean that someone who doesn't have those credentials can't know a whole lot? Of course it doesn't. You know something because you've studied it. You know something because you've learned it, because you've experienced it. What do human credentials have to do with it? And that's even true in our natural life. Now let's come into the assembly. All that stuff, doctorate degrees, master's degrees, bachelor's degrees, society memberships, the bridge club, whatever you belong to, is left at the door. It means nothing. It's farcical to God. What does he care about that? God cares about truth. He cares, he cares about spiritual things. He cares about gifts that the Holy Spirit has given. He cares about worshipers whose hearts are warm and in love with his son. That's what he cares about. Does that mean he doesn't have equipped, he hasn't equipped people who do spiritual service? Of course he does. God's a big equipper. God believes in experts even, in a sense. But they're all amateur experts. What does amateur mean? Say it's somebody who thinks he's good but isn't. Who can't really put the time into it to become a real athlete. Well, no, that's not what it means. An amateur is someone who does something because he loves it. Ama, right? Amo, ama, sama. I love. That's where that word comes from. An amateur is who does something because he loves it. He's not being paid for it. He's not, it's not expected of him, but he just loves it. So I'm an amateur gardener, right? And you're an amateur something. I'm sure you are. Now, when it comes to spiritual things, God's very interested in amateurs. He wants people who are in it because they love it. He wants people who are in it who are not getting paid for it, who are not trafficking in spiritual things, who are not beholden to CEO pastors and mega complexes that are really giant businesses. God doesn't care about those things. You say, well, who's going to teach us? He better go to seminary. Well, you know, I, I thank God for every seminary that has upheld truth, and there are about three of them, if that. Seminaries are the fastest way for truth to go into the southern direction and take a nosedive. But there are good people in those institutions. Again, going back to disclaimer number one, right? Here's my question. Does God care if you have a THD? Does God care if you went to Dallas? He doesn't care. People care. He doesn't care. That's not how he necessarily... Does that mean that everyone who's gone there has not been equipped and that all of that was wasted time? Of course not. God could sanctify a whole lot of that stuff. My point isn't to despise Christian education even. My point is to come back to this central principle. God doesn't care about human degrees, human training centers, human societies, or anything like that. He wants people who are trained by him in his word with real life experience to go along with whatever doctrine they hold. He'll give them some teaching and he'll say, okay, obey it. They say, no, I'm not going to obey it. He says, okay, you're stuck. Until you're ready to obey me, I'm not going to go to stage two. You're not going to go from 101 to 201. You say, okay, I'll obey you. All right, here's 201. You don't have to do that in seminary. All you have to do is pass the exams. Now, I hope I'm not coming across in the way I do not intend. I am appalled at the ignorance, pardon me, of many believers. But I'm also appalled at my own unspirituality and the coldness of my heart. God needs both. He provides it. We don't need experts. We don't need professionals. We need amateurs. We need people who are in it because they love it, because they've been saved, because they are absolutely committing their lives to Christ with no monetary gain. Now, in saying that, I'm not suggesting that every pastor who takes a paycheck is guilty of simony. That would be a terrible thing for me to say. Nor am I saying that those who give their full-time service to the gospel or even to ministry do not deserve and have every right to be expected to be supported. But the question is how they look to God. He provides for them. The free will offerings of people. God provides. You don't trade so much spiritual service for so much money. That's simony. And if you don't know what simony is, you'll have to look it up because it's time for our break. We just have a short number of things I want to talk about afterwards. Let me just pray briefly to close this part of the meeting, and then when you hear the saints singing, it's time to come back in. All right. Heavenly Father.